All right, so shall we begin? Um, welcome to our next panel. The, this next panel is on global architectures of art, past, present, and place. Um, I'll be the moderator for this panel. My name is Stephanie DeBoer. I'm pr associate professor in the media school here at Indiana University. Um, and I was part of the earlier Framing the Global group, and it's really lovely to see people again. It's really, really lovely. Um, so I will be introducing our first panelist here, who is, um, who is Manuela, um, finding your introduction, yeah. So Manuela Ciari, she's an anthropologist by training, and she's Associate Professor of Global Studies at Aarhus Univer University um, and in Denmark. She's part of the Framing, global, Framing the Global project, and in her project within that group is that she carried out for this initiative is a large-scale ethnography of the global spread of modern and contemporary art from India in London, Venice, Shanghai, New York, and Kochi. Okay, uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, um, yeah. So good afternoon everyone and thanks for coming and I'm gonna be the broken record again. Uh, uh, thanks to Framing the Global for, for, for having me here. Um, and it's so nice to see um, fellows and also uh, uh, you know, news scholars uh, and I'm, uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, uh, meet you all. Um, so my, t my paper uh, is titled Stage the Contemporary, the Art, Architecture, Archaeology, Heritage Complex at the Kochi Musiris Biennale. So uh, in 2016, The Guardian uh, featured an article on the lost port of Musiris in Kerala, South India, in its Lost Cities series. Here, the yet-to-be-found Musiris featured alongside the extensively excavated sites of Troy, Babylon, Pompeii, and Agwar. Um, I had known about the port's existence uh, since he had become part of the Kochi Musiris Biennale, or KMB, inaugurated in 2012 in Kerala, and I've been researching this Biennale as, ever since its first iteration, so it's part of the, my global ethnography. Um, attracting visitors locally and further afield, uh, the KMB is an artist curated Biennale, and it was conceived under the compulsion of setting up a cultural institution uh, by the government of Kerala. Uh, and Musiris, this lost port, lies at the core of the Biennale's branding process. Described by the Roman historian and naturalist um, Pliny the Elder as the first emporium of India, especially thanks to its prime commodity, uh, black pepper, largely sold uh, to Rome, Musiris reached its peak of prosperity in the first century AD, and after that it gradually faded into obscurity. Uh, the port appears in this um, very famous, uh, it's called a uh, map, called Pitunger map. It's a, this is a 13th century copy of a 4th century map of the Roman world. Um, then the port is said to have disappeared in the 14th century, um, apparently um, as a result of a flood. A claim circulate that the actual site of Musiris has been identified in a village uh, not far, actually, from the site of the Biennale. However, opinions on this matter remain highly divided. The hype around Musiris is not entirely surprising if one considers that the port's name has been strategically deployed to resignify an entire region within Kerala, which was turned into the large Musiris heritage project in 2006 and then inaugurated 10 years later. The MHP comprises archaeological sites, uh, museums, synagogues, mosques, temples, as well as Portuguese and, and Dutch colonial buildings, testifying to the region as a crossroads for many communities uh, and cultures over the centuries. Uh, building on this history, the Biennale, the Kochi Musiris Biennale, um, has its claims about the region's cosmopolitanism as part of its branding process. Uh, the KMB could be viewed as a rare experiment of an archaeological biennale um, situated within the very underexplored under world of the encounter between contemporary art and archaeology, which has known a, 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 a degree of popularity with many exhibitions held in various, various world locations. However, in Kerala, the hyphenation between Kochi and Musiris through the Biennale has inaugurated a much broader process which has seen the simultaneous and overlapping mobilization of art, archaeology, heritage, all inscribed in a built environment which is part lost, Musiris, and part revitalized materially and discursively through the use of heritage buildings and other venues in Kochi and in the Musiris Heritage Project. 
Um, and despite the presence of so many biennales around the world, and while Biennale re increasingly represents one of the most visible faces of art circulation, um, ethnographies on these uh, you know, exhibitions are still quite rare. Um, and, and today I analyze aspects of the KMB as part of the process of re territorialization of the Biennale uh, Global Cultural Forum um, in a Global South context. This is what I have written about in our Framing the Global um, uh, book. There I explore the analytics of this um, cultural form. And so I'll set to explore the KMB through what I call here the art architecture archaeology heritage complex, a class which is actually able to capture uh, the material and immaterial dimensions of such re-territorialization. So the choice of the complex is indebted to Hall Foster's um, work, Art and Architecture, um, uh, dissecting art and architectural encounters since the last almost half a century through projects undertaken by prominent architects such as Renzo Piano, uh, Zaha Hadid, and, and, and many others. Their, project, their projects, uh, Foster argues, have gone to mostly transform Western world cityscapes, which, with some examples uh, outside the West, and have propagated what he called uh, global styles. These trends are intertwined with post-war Western art currents. Well, India has housed projects by prominent architects in the decades following the um, you know, independence. The country has only recently begun to witness the execution of futuristic um, architectural projects like the ones that Foster um, uh, analyzes. So Foster's Heart and Architectural Complex serves as a springboard to reflect on, recla on the reclamation rather than the ex novel construction and repurposing of buildings and their architectures left behind by colonial enterprises and communities of, of various provenance in Kerala by placing artworks in them. And this is highly significant given, that the, given the widely shared view that the Biennale's success owes a great deal to its location and venues. Uh, the succession of imperial enterprises landed on coaches' shores marks the city's built environment. Its textures transformation is etched on a plaque titled Milestones of Cochin, placed at the feet of a tree in the city center. The temporal time frame uh, ranges from the construction of the first Portuguese port in uh, 1503 to 1920 with the dredging of Cochin port and interspersed with the dates of conquest by the Dutch in 1663 uh, and the British 1795 is the construction of forts, bastions, and other buildings, including religious ones, and given the, uh, sort of giving rise to the very palimpsestic te texture of the city. Um, against this backdrop stand the core can, can be venues, uh, Aspin Wall um, House in Fort Kochi, this one, <laughs> which is the heart of the, the, the Biennale since its very first edition. Uh, this vast complex housed uh, English trader John Aspinwall's business and included offices and warehouse um, spaces. It was established in 1867 and it traded in coconut oil, pepper, timber, lemongrass oil, uh, ginger, turmeric, uh, and various spices. Um, and it still exists today as an Indian company. At a walking distance from Aspinwall lies the other major Biennale site called Cabral Yard, named after the Portuguese navigator. Um, and this, uh, uh, this venue, uh, I mean, basically this space, according to the Biennale website, um, was acquired by Aspinwall Company at the end of the 19th century when it began trading in coir. And since 2016, um, the, a pavilion was, um, well, in 2016, a pavilion was constructed in, um, on its premises. Um, KMB's reuse of the remains of the past points to Anne Stoller's question of, um, and I'm quoting from her, how imperial formations persist in their material debris, in ruined landscapes, and through the social ruination of people's lives. And he also points, unquote, and he also points to the task of attending to, and I'm quoting from her again, uh, their, their reappropriations and strategic and active positioning within the politics of the present, unquote. In duress, however, Stoller states that she does not want to focus on what she calls leftovers i.e. the colonial buildings and homes turn into tourist sites or hotels, that is, as she says, comforting affirmations that colonialisms are over, unquote. Well, with regard to the KMB's use of 
leftovers, I would argue that the question about, about positioning is still relevant. And I'm interested in what happens when artworks are placed in these leftovers and how they mobilize each other, rather than the venues being solely interrogated for their coloniality turned into heritage um, uh, commodity. In addition, I'm interested in, in the leftovers transformed by the artworks and Biennale discourses that privilege selected transoceanic and regional pasts through the idiom of trade out of the region at the expenses of what that trade has meant locally and regionally. And the politics of the present uh, also calls into question issues of space. And Minale have been sites um, for the expansion of the white cube outside the gallery uh, space. And lamenting this, uh, Filipovic suggested that the solution is not, and I'm quoting from her, is not merely inserting works in crumbling industrial buildings or, on, or any number of other exotic locales, unquote. Well, the white cube model uh, connects the uh, KMB uh, venues and the muse with the museum buildings which have given ri rise to the art and architectural complex analyzed by Foster, despite their radically different semblances. Um, and the white cube clearly means commodification. One of the reasons behind Forster's choice of complex is, um, and I'm quoting from him, to indicate how the capitalist subsumption of the cultural into the economic often prompts the repurposing of such art architecture combination as points of attraction and or sites of display, unquote. So overall, reflections on the nexus between the economic and the cultural are really inescapable at the KMB, ranging from the returns of setting up a biennale in a locale with virtually no contemporary art infrastructure to value production for the artist curators, exhibiting artists and artworks, and the galleries, auction houses, collectors, and patrons who are part of biennale governance. And now I'd like to briefly <laughs> touch upon the reuse of warehouses which have been among KMB's signature venues. In this region, the most notable warehouse repurposing has occurred uh, for artworks display uh, purposes rather than for residential ones, unlike the fashion of loft living, which began in the early 70s in the US and Western Europe and analyzed by uh, Sharon Zukin. With regard to these types of space, deindustrialization has, has had altogether outcomes um, in India. Um, in Kochi, some warehouses are, were and are in a state of dilapidation. Some are still used by the Biennale, and some are better maintained, and many are still in use by traders. Um, some warehouses have been radically transformed uh, as a result of the Biennale. Pepper House, the one you see here, a core KMB venue since its beginning, testifies to a successful makeover. So the KMB website tells us that, and I'm quoting from them, Pepper House is a waterfront, waterfront heritage property. The building consists of two historical go-downs, uh, that is an Indian word for dockside warehouse, these large two-story buildings with Dutch-style clay roofs are separated by a large courtyard, which would have been um, once used for storing goods, uh, waiting to be loaded onto ships in the harbor." Unquote. So the Pepper House complex, as it, as it is termed in the Biennale website, has a courtyard cafe, a gallery, studios for artist residencies, and host art events, um, also outside the KMB time frame. So Pepper House really stands for, global, for a global, for global style. It features the elements which any art center would offer in many world locations, featuring just different architectures. And it's termed as property in proper real estate lexicon. However, warehouse and go-downs conjure up much more than only spices and goods and their oceanic travels. As KM, the KMB's idioms of cosmopolitanism has foregrounded outward connections rather than the effects that trade has produced in the region, these discourses occlude historical relations of domination for sections of the populations under the politics of the present, especially in terms of histories of labor. For example, agrestic slaves were employed in agricultural production, and um, Kochi played a pivotal role in the slave trade. In a study of private slave trade under the Dutch East India Company in the 18th century, Mbeki and Vorosum have argued that while the, the, um, the Cape of Good Hope and Batavia were the main destinations for slaves, and now I'm quoting from them, Kochi was the most important settlement of the company on the Indian Malabar coast, which was one of the main regions of origin for enslaved subjects in the Asian and South African regions under Dutch control, unquote. 
Yes. <laughs> Finally, the cosmopolitan the narrative of cosmopolitanism, foregrounded by the KMB, surprisingly does not include migrant workers from Kerala to the Gulf. Very important trend since the 1970s. And these workers have not been viewed as subjects of cosmopolitanism. On the other hand, yes, uh, the, Biennale pro uh, the Biennale projects itself as people's Biennale. And together with cosmopolitanism, this has become another successful aspect of the branding process. Um, at the KMB, one surely can observe uh, visitors from all walks of life. However, the Biennale would be an, anac an anachronism if it were in the People's Biennale, given that our era is one of the, the maximum public outreach by art institutions. And to conclude, Hall Foster has offered yet another uh, um, reason as to why he wanted to use the word complex to speak about art and architecture. He argued that he meant, um, and I'm quoting from him, uh, complex as a syndrome, one that is difficult to identify as such, let alone overcome, precisely because he appears so intrinsic, so natural to cultural operations today, unquote. Uh, today, I imagine the complex syndrome in a tropical setting like Kerala, largely popularized for its natural beauty, where the Biennale and its working seem very natural and desirable because this is how culture is run today. The, by looking at the Biennale through the lens of the ar architecture, uh, archaeology, and heritage complex, I just aim to offer an alternative reading of what it feels to enter a KM venue next time. Thank you. So introducing our second speaker. Um, so um, this is K Karen uh, Zizowitz, and she is Associate Pro Professor of Art History and Visual Cult Culture at uh, Michigan State. As you can see the, t the title of the talk here, What Can Anthropolo the Anthropology of Infrastructure Tell Us About Global Contemporary Art? Um, she is, uh, the paper her, that, that, that is drawn from, the paper today is drawn from her book manuscript, Infrastructure and Form, Contemporary Art, India and Globalization, 1991 to 2008. Um, and this book, which accounts for the effects of liberalization of India's economy and contemporary art in the region, follows her study of other, the other major historical shifts in the 1990s, which was the rise of Hindu nationalism. I think that context is quite useful. Um, and so with no more ado, yeah. go for it. Thank you, Steph, and thank you all for uh, staying this to the last panel. I appreciate that. Um, and not just going to the bar. Um, we can do that afterwards. All right. So viewers enter Vivan Sundaram's memorial through a set of steel barriers, one of many types used in India to control foot traffic or corral crowds. From there, viewer movement is unfettered except perhaps by habits of art viewing that would discourage walking on the sandstone tiles that mark a path through the room or force a choice of how to cross the brick moat, bricked moat. Most would move between the glass vitrines and frame photographs on the walls to end up on the other side of the room looking back, back at a gate of tin trunks that unfortunately you can't see but are emblazoned with the neon words, fallen mortal. Nearly all of those vitrines and frames contain reproductions of the same newspaper photograph of the crumpled body of a man left where he was killed on the street in Bombay. Each photograph is altered with nails and translucent paper obscuring the image of the body in various ways. At the center of the installation is a mausoleum, a triangular prism of glass and marble in which lies a life-sized rendering of the body in plaster. Celebrated as an incisive reaction to the Bombay riots of 1992-93, readings of this work have typically focused on its status as one of the first installations produced by an Indian artist. This is the narrative that is in, in, encouraged by India's preeminent art critic, Geeta Kapoor, who happens also to be the artist's wife, as well as by Sundaram himself, who sees this work as a decisive break with his past practice as a painter. In memorial, Sundaram makes a series of allusions to past art, 
including the floor sculptures of Carl Andre and the uses of Pietro Dura cladding for India's most famous mausoleum, the Taj Mahal. Sundaram's version uses that medium to refer to the image practices of Nasri Muhammadi, a, Mus a Muslim artist whose quiet, meditative work has been tied to Mughal architecture. Sundaram's memorial is itself a key marker in Indian art history, kicking off a period of rapid change for Indian contemporary art. That period, roughly the 90s and 2000s, is also one in which artists began to gain international recognition through exhibitions, including biennials, and an art market that grew exponentially until it could arguably be described as global. Not for nothing, Memorial is currently in Munich's Haus der Kunst, where Sundaram's major retrospective is on view until next week. These two art historical readings of Memorial one interpreting its meanings and unpacking its references, the other marking its role in a story of institutional change, are both clearly important. But they should be supplemented by a third reading that pays attention to how memorial combines spatial practices associated with art with those related to the city. This would have been clearest during the first exhibition of the work, which was at New Delhi's AFAX Gallery an art institution located at the very heart of India's state apparatus, where, especially in times of heightened alert, uh, viewers would almost certainly have had to move through the same steel barriers, or similar ones, uh, in memorial at least once or twice on their way in to see the work. In its form, then, memorial collapses the boundaries between the infrastructures of art and those of everyday life. My current uh, research concerns this period of unprecedented change in the forms of Indian art and its institutions, one bookended by the economic markers of the liberalization of India's economy in 1991 and the onset of the Great Recession, which happened in India in 2008. It took about three months for things to really happen there. What interests me is how rapid and how wide-ranging those changes were. In other words, I'm trying to account for efflorescence by which I mean multiplying growth and transformation in a series of interlocking artistic and social forms. One of the key challenges I face here is finding a mode of analysis that can consider together the three kinds of form that I've already outlined for memorial. The form of art, with attention to trajectories of medium and material. The form of art institutions, with attention to curatorial framing and circulation and the forms of everyday life with attention to the materialities of economic and political change. As the title of this paper suggests, I have found the emergent anthropological literature on infrastructure useful in this regard. I have, I, for one reason for this, hinted already in my reading of Memorial's use of steel barricades, is the increasing use of infrastructural forms and or materials in artistic work itself. Artists from India and South Asia have focused their work on roads, trains, water, and trash, as well as on a variety of systems for the circulation of images and other forms of information. Indeed, one of the markers of global contemporary art, one of the ways that it has earned the adjective global, has been the attention that it pays to architectures of circulation. But my interest in the literature on infrastructure has also to do with the dependence of the efflorescence of Indian contemporary art on the growth of a complex network of institutions. Most of the commercial galleries, nonprofit spaces, and residencies in India, as well as the connections to similar spaces abroad, either developed after 1991 or grew in this period to include India as a site. Although it's typically used metaphorically, the term art infrastructure actually does conform to Brian Larkin's definition of the term as a architecture for circulation or built network that facilitates the flow of goods, people, or ideas and allows for their exchange over space. The anthropology of infrastructure, by contrast to other more social science or engineering literatures, uh, deals not only with the architectures of infrastructural networks, but also, as Larkin puts it, their, quote, politics and poetics. An examination of art infrastructure would move in the opposite direction, from a discourse preoccupied with, with the aesthetic and political significance, with politic, uh, sorry, from a discourse preoccupied with aesthetic and political significance into one that integrates considerations of the materiality of artistic practices and their circulation. 
Suction analysis would address the mixture of institutions of patronage, material structures of transmission or travel, and frameworks of thought alongside contemporary art itself. Together, their material and immaterial elements, quote, shape the nature of a, ne of a network, as Larkin writes, including, quote, the speed and direction of its movement, its temporalities, and its vulnerabilities to break breakdown. I focused on these aspects of infrastructure in a recent article on the establishment of a network of exchanges between artists across South Asia. The South Asian Network for the Arts, or SANA, and this is, or SANA, which is this group of people on the bottom left, established in 2000 and dissolved in 2011. It facilitated artistic exchanges across the highly contested borders in the region. SANA was made up of Koj in India, Vassal in Pakistan, Tirtha in Sri Lanka, and Brito in Bangladesh, which are all member organizations of the UK-based Triangle Network. The principal goal of these individual organizations was the development of cutting our edge art practice in each country. But the signature gesture of the network was the uh, pan-regional international workshop. SANA grappled with the specific conditions of the South Asian region with its legacy of state opposition to the movement of both people and things across the national borders of the region. Workshops and uh, collaborative projects began to treat border crossing infrastructure, or its lack, as a formal constraint as important to the production of art as the specificities of medium. Artists adjusted their practices to fit within expectations that artwork would likely never leave the workshop site, sometimes by looking, uh, using local materials and other times by making temporary site-specific installations. And here what you have is an installation that's made out of uh, the residual effects of oil washing out onto the beach from the ocean uh, on top of sand. So that's very temporary. The related project, R Par, uh, which had three editions in 2000, 2002, and 2004, in which groups of Indian and Pakistani artists sent their work to be displayed in public spaces across the border, experimented to find the best media form for their purposes. They began with small mail-ready works before using the then new internet to send digital files for posters that were printed on site. For the third edition, not shown here, they displayed digital videos sent across the border on hard drives. These projects exploited the question of visibility or of the visibility or invisibility of infrastructures in everyday life, which happens to be one of the most insistent debates within the anthropology of infrastructure. Sana's cross-border art artistic exchanges rendered infrastructures visible in their recalcitrance or failure bringing the struggle to raise funding, the holds placed on shipments of works by customs officials, and the visas denied to artists by embassies into the fore. In so doing, the exchanges made clear how art infrastructure not only depends upon other infrastructural systems, but is, like them, a network form. And while participants in the South Asian Network for the Arts tend to emphasize the human network, the friendships that they built with people from what are considered to be hostile countries. The projects make it clear that art networks are, to borrow a key insight of actor network theory, assemblages of human and non-human entities. Their analysis necessitates attention to the ways in which people and things, practices and discourses share agency. A fuller reading of art infrastructure would emphasize actor network theory's dismissal of the idea of context, a concept that allows for the differentiation of events from the structures that produce them. A network-driven approach uh, to art would disturb the isolation and therefore the unique agency granted to artwork and artists alike as they are drawn out of, the, uh, out of analytically, from a largely passive infrastructure. This approach is built into the medium of installation for which is marked by its dissolution of the boundary between the art object and the space in which it's seen. Works like Sundaram's memorial have a critique of context as one of their chief formal characteristics. But even in painting, the medium most durably associated with the fetishization of the art object, my research has found an analogous move and a new focus on infrastructures for the circulation of images. From the mid-1990s, Indian practices of painting were impinged upon by a quick succession of new image technologies as fax, satellite television, cell phones, personal computing, and the internet were all introduced into India in under a decade. 
Instead of ushering in the demise of painting as a medium of art, as critics often framed it in the moment, these new media shaped painting practice without displacing it on the Indian art scene. In fact, the years just after 2000 were the site of a giant boom in painting based in, in uh, the contemporary image condition. An early such work is when so many spectacles happened, I see saw, which Indian painter Jitish Kalat made as a college student in 1996. While there's evidence of Kalat's training in abstract painting, namely in his careful excavation of layers of paint using a palette knife, the work is principally a play on the reproduced image, a septuple self-portrait achieved with some help from, an, a Xerox, uh, from Xerox and fax machines. In the main image of the artist, the head is distorted into a squat shape with puffy hair, uh, a, a tropical flower tucked behind an ear. Its torso is painted as if dressed in a loose-fitting shirt with a necklace of stenciled eyeglasses, below which the image of the head is echoed in a less detailed way with the flower replaced by a palm tree. With each corner containing a less manipulated photo transfer of the artist for comparison, one suspects that the main image has been deliberately morphed until it looks like none other than Bal Thakare, then leader of the city's hyper, uh, ruling hyper-nationalist party, the Shiv Sena. The pun-filled uh, title refers to Thakare's indulgence in political spectacle, including the same street violence that is referred to in Sundaram's memorial. However complex, all of this image work is carefully light and ironic, uh, lying above uh, the most serious of serious abstract forms of painting. Kalat's painting reflects some of the new image forms made possible in the city, and therefore hooks into a different urban infrastructure than the one pointed to by Sundaram. One of the least obvious but most consequential of these technological changes for artists came in advances to color printing, which allowed for the new production of things like art magazines, which uh, this and this painting came at the same exact moment that Art India began to be published. Kalat's painting is part of a larger practice then emergent in Bombay that collapsed the boundaries between individual works of art and a hyperactive image culture. Not only did such painting refer to its forms and adopt its techniques, but it also circulated freely within these image networks, both in their physical form as paintings and in as reproductions. A proper reading of these changes in artistic practice would acknowledge how works like those of Kalat and Sundaram like the activities of the South Asian Network for the Arts, dissolve into their supposed context of circulation. The key thing, I think, is not to treat such artworks as statements, critical or not, on a thing called globalization, as is most commonly done in the global history of, of contemporary art. They should instead be seen as nodes in three intersecting networks, uh, networked infrastructures for art, its institutions, and everyday life. Now in Q&A, I'd be happy to say more about the methodological differences with global art history. That's fine. It's hard to maintain that kind of separation. I've kind of stacked the deck here by showing you these particular works of art. What's left is a fuller exploration, and that's what my book's supposed to be about, of the implications of this methodological shift for historians of contemporary art. And I hope that we can continue that in discussion today. Thanks very much. And our third, I'll come over here again. So our third presentation is by Heather Aku, um, and she is um, is associate professor of fashion design and director of the Elizabeth mm -hmm. Sage Historic Costume Collection, which we will talk, she will talk about, mm -hmm. um, and that which is part of the School of Art, Architecture, and Design at Indiana University. Uh, her research focuses on African dress and fashion, contemporary Islamic fashion, aesthetics, politics, embodied religious practices, and representations of non-Western fashion and scholarship and museum collections. All right, thank you very much. All right, we only have 15 minutes, so I'm just going to dive in. All right, so in the study, oh, and I'm also super tall, so hopefully you can hear me. Uh, in the study of fashion design and fashion history, a discipline driven by close observations of images and objects, fashion collections are vital resources for teaching, exhibitions, and research. 
In North America, some of the largest collections are at the Met, the Museum at FIT, the Royal Ontario Museum, the Chicago Historical Society, and the Batashu Museum in Toronto. There are also several universities with significant collections, including Drexel, Kent State, Cornell, Rhode Island, and Minnesota. Although the fashion industry is heavily globalized and has been for centuries, most fashion collections in Europe and North America collect mostly or even exclusively from the West. Fashion scholars are beginning to recognize other global fashion systems, including Asian fashion, African fashion, and Islamic fashion, but this absence of non-Western examples in fashion collections continues to be a barrier to research on the history of non-Western fashion. Even our ability to study the history of Western fashion has been skewed by a predominance of objects from white, middle to upper class, cisgender, native-born, well-educated donors. In 2017, I replaced Kate Rowald as the director of the Elizabeth Sage Historic Costume Collection at IU, which is one of the oldest and largest university-based collections of costume and fashion in uh, North America. This paper explores the history of the Sage Collection, focusing on Elizabeth Sage, how she developed the collection to support her innovative classes on costume history, how the collection came to exclude non-Western fashion, and my efforts to expand the collection in new ways by fostering new kinds of donor relationships. All right, so uh, Elizabeth Sage was born in 1868 in Buffalo, New York, just 20 years after the famous Seneca Falls Convention on Women's Rights. Perhaps inspired by that atmosphere of political activism, when Sage finished her high school diploma, she made the bold move of heading to New York City and continuing her education at Columbia. In 1902, she earned a bachelor's diploma in home economics, staying there to teach for the next eight years. In 1913, when the Board of Trustees at Indiana University decided to establish a Department of Home Economics, the first professor they hired was Mabel Wellman, a home economist from Wellesley with expertise in cooking and nutrition. The second, Elizabeth Sage, was hired to teach classes on textiles, clothing construction, and other aspects of the quote-unquote domestic arts. I use Bulletin for 1917 shows her teaching applied design, advanced dressmaking, clothing laboratory, a graduate class on the teaching of domestic art, and another five credit class on the history of costume and costume design. In 1924, she wrote to the university's president, William Lowe Bryan, asking for a sabbatical in order to advance her research. Quote, my dear Dr. Bryan, may I ask for a leave of absence for the second semester of next year? I'm anxious to spend the time abroad studying historic costume and other subjects connected with my work here. Yours sincerely, Elizabeth Sage. I loved finding this letter. In an interview for the student newspaper, she described the plan for her sabbatical as sailing from New York to the Mediterranean, then traveling through Italy and Holland to spend several months in Paris. In 1926, she published one of the first ever textbooks on the history of fashion, which I have a copy of, A Study of Costume. The first chapter focuses on ancient Egypt, drawing illustrations from an earlier book, Costume of the Ancients by Thomas Hope. But Sage also included some observations from her own travels, and this is a quote from the book. Uh, the, the women of modern Egypt wear black when appearing out of doors. Among the lower classes, even the face veil is black, with a curious brass cylinder in the center of the forehead, having one, two, or three rings, depending upon whether the woman is single, engaged, or married. Color is supplied by the men, who are very gay in their long, broad cloth coats of green, blue, violet, and deep red, their broad sashes and cashmere scarves, which they throw carelessly over their shoulder in the daytime, and use to cover their head and neck as soon as the sun has set." Unquote. The back of the book has 10 pages of patterns for constructing a range of historic garments, including a frock coat, a doublet, a shirtwaist, and a Japanese kimono. Clearly, Sage wanted her students to incorporate their lessons on the history of fashion into their designs, which was a practical approach for a professor of textiles and clothing in the early 20th century. But she was also open to learning about non-Western styles of dress. In 1934, she took another sabbatical in order to travel and study abroad. When she retired in 1937, Sage gave her collection to the department, which eagerly accepted it and continued to use it as a resource for teaching. Upon her death in 1959, the university noted, quote, since her retirement, this collection has been enlarged by gifts from her personal friends and friends of the Department of Home Economics. It is now known as the Elizabeth Sage Historic Costume Collection and is considered to be exceptionally fine, unquote. In 1966, an appraisal conducted for insurance purposes so showed that the Sage Collection contained four quote-unquote oriental costumes valued at $1,600 and 21 boxes of national costumes valued at $630, which was nearly 9% of the total value of the collection. 
A brochure produced by the department in the 1970s or early 80s describes the SAGE collection as an academic resource used by students, faculty, and independent researchers studying fashion history, apparel design, conservation, and the social and cultural aspects of clothing. It also describes how the collection had grown from several hundred pieces to more than 4,000. Quote, the collection's primary emphasis is American culture, including both everyday and high fashion clothing. In addition, clothing and textiles from other Western as well as non-Western cultures form an important part of the collection, unquote. By 1992, when the collection was being packed and moved from its original location in Wiley Hall to a facility off campus, a press release noted that it had grown to 12,000 pieces with a value of more than $3 million. Without mentioning any non-Western dress, the assistant curator observed that the collection contained many unique and irreplaceable artifacts, such as a child's linen waistcoat from the mid-1700s, a jacket worn by Hoagie Carmichael, a Rosie the Riveter factory uniform from World War II, and high-end fashions from many famous designers. By the time I took over as director, the collection had doubled again in both size and value. However, the focus had been deliberately narrowed to exclude non-Western fashion. As described in a report to the new dean of the School of Art, Architecture, and Design in 2016, quote, objects in the Sage Fashion Collection originate from the late 18th century through the early 21st century. Men's, women's, and children's clothing, accessories, and related items illustrate fashion cycles and textile innovations in the United States and Western Europe. Flat domestic textiles are not within the Sage collecting policies, nor are national dress and textiles from other continents, unquote. Very disappointing for me. Although the Sage Collection had never been very active in collecting examples of non-Western dress and fashion, this gradual exclusion can be partly explained by the collection's increasing collaboration with the Mathers Museum of World Cultures, which was founded at IU in 1943. At some point in the 1980s, the directors of Mathers and Sage came to an informal agreement. Mathers would transfer its holdings of Euro-American clothing and accessories to the Sage Collection, while Sage would transfer any non-Western artifacts to Mathers. The goal was to avoid duplication of efforts, streamlining their missions, and maximizing the use of storage space. In 1985, the Mathers transferred 110 artifacts to Sage. In 1988, Sage transferred 72 quilts and textiles to Mathers. The largest transfer happened in 2008 when Sage transferred 177 non-Western textiles. Among those objects were the four oriental robes mentioned in the 1966 appraisal. On the surface, this seems like a really practical move. No museum can collect everything that might be interesting to future scholars and students, particularly objects like clothing and accessories that are so ubiquitous in society. Only a tiny proportion of the items that are currently being worn will ever end up in a museum. Although the Mathers still collects textiles, clothing, and accessories, it emphasizes these artifacts as examples of material culture, attempting to honor the vast diversity of cultures in the world. Sage, on the other hand, focuses on how styles of clothing and accessories change over time, in part due to culture, but also due to technological innovations in design and manufacturing. Collecting culture is different from collecting history. As a category of objects, fashionable dress is particularly difficult to collect. It changes rapidly, can be very expensive, is often difficult to store, and like art, high-end fashion pushes the boundaries of mainstream culture. Some of it will change the way all of us dress, much of it will not. It takes special expertise to recognize what trends may or may not be valuable in the future. Although the Mathers Museum does not exclude fashion from its collection, and in fact is very open to fashion, it does not make any special effort to collect it. Unfortunately, when the staff of the two collections agreed to a split on the basis of geography, it reinforced a major stereotype in the discipline of fashion studies that fashion is Western and culture is non-Western. While the demographics of the U.S. have changed dramatically since the Sage Collection was founded, working class and minority histories are barely represented. Fashion history has gained legitimacy as an academic area of study. However, the shape of the collection continues to affect research and teaching opportunities. Because the Sage Collection is an organization within a nonprofit university, its growth is entirely dependent on donors. In 2017, the collection acquired 419 new objects from 18 donors. Five were employees of Indiana University, but the others also had connections as alumni, parents, or friends. The chances that someone with no connections to the university would know about the Sage Collection and offer to make a donation are unfortunately quite small. Of course, the demographics of universities like IU are skewed compared to the general population. According to census data published in 2017, only 12.8% of adults in the U.S. have some kind of graduate or professional degree. 
While the numbers are fairly even for men and women, they vary significantly by race. Only 8.8% .8 of black Americans and 5% of Hispanics of all races have a graduate or professional degree, while 24.3% of Asian Americans do. This lack of familiarity with graduate education and research universities in certain populations contributes to the gaps we have in the SAGE collection. While the existing collection is a gem worth preserving, one of my goals as director is to make connections with new donor communities and to begin diversifying the collection. For example, uh, as a convert to Islam and a scholar of contemporary Islamic fashion, I've published articles about the clothing choices of Muslims in North America, which are connected to fashions from the Middle East, but shaped by the unique context of North America. Uh, I've already begun donating pieces from my research and personal collection, including a head covering for athletes made by the Dutch company Capster, three outfits from Macy's launch of an Islamic fashion collection in 2017, which was the first mainstream corporation in North America to do so, casual garments for men sold by Canadian retailer Muslim Gear, and an authentic burkini designed by Ahide Zanetti, an Australian woman of Lebanese descent. I also have plans to develop new relationships with donor communities in rural Indiana. Fashion theory postulates that styles tr typically trickle down from upper, upper class to lower class, with some exceptions like blue jeans, but is that really true today? Having grown up in the rural Midwest, I suspect that there are actually rural working class styles and histories that have simply not been well represented in fashion collections. Another target I have in mind is cosplay, excuse me, um, uh, which is another rapidly growing global subculture full of passionate designers making fantastic and often highly technical costumes for role playing. And cosplay is particularly predominant in the US and in Japan, but is really growing all over the world. And there are just Every single year, there are more and more conventions all over the world, so this is a, a huge thing that I want to pursue. Um, the thing is, I'm not sure any museum is actually collecting these costumes. Um, I'm fortunate to know another prominent scholar of fashion, Thrasa Wingy, who's at Michigan State with Karin, uh, who does research with cosplayers in the US and can facilitate the necessary connections, and we're brainstorming about how to make that happen. As the director of SAGE and as a scholar and teacher of fashion studies, I feel a responsibility to grow our collection in new ways that will support more inclusive, globalized research and teaching in the 21st century and beyond. Thank you. So our final, yeah, our final talk is from Cindy Shinichi. She is a second year art history master's student at the Institute of Fine Arts uh, in New York, at New York University. Um, she has a wide range of research interests. Currently her research is focused on the Northern Song Dynasty in pre-modern China and the robust literati culture and exchange that facilitated developments in the arts. She's also interested in the development of exchange that has facilitated develop, uh, excuse me, the developments of Chinese art since the late 20th century and the narratives that are used to systematize and retrace this emergence. As an she's also an independent curator, right? Um, and has curated or is curating an exhibition that opens up uh, that highlights the multifaceted identities of emerging and up and coming artists today and to encourage a broader and more encompassing idea of identities in the arts. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, today, I'll be talking about the challenges that Chinese modern artists have historically faced to explain the compelling need of concepts such as global contemporary art. Through analysis of three case studies, um, I will be focusing on artists who have chosen to adopt a very specific medium, blue and white ceramics, to discuss why global contemporary art, a disciplinary trend attempting to open, the, to open up the geographical boundary of traditional art historical practice, provides a great and much needed platform to understand the art produced in this new millennium. Traditionally, our historical discourse has been firmly rooted in the Western cultural history, ignoring and ignoring, excluding much of the works created in the rest of the world. Chinese art, especially the arts coming from mainland China, were seen, in, were seen as stuck in the past, and China's modern artists were perceived as derivatives of their Western counterparts. When Chinese artists began to have their works exhibited in international biennials, exhibitions, and galleries during the late 20th century, as the country's economy was reopening and, the first wave, and when the first waves of globalization were felt, 
Chinese artists came face to face with this East-West dichotomy. They became very aware of their cultural identity to the West and how their works were decontextualized and recontextualized in a, into a Western narrative. In hopes to differentiate themselves from their Western counterparts and this newfound awareness of their identity as Chinese, artists of this period looked to their own cultural traditions to revive specific media that are compatible with their own identity. Moving forward, these sentiments of tradition continue, but shift slightly from a refocus on, from a focus on revival of tradition to reconsideration and reinvention of tradition. This shift has been readily documented and discussed in many forms of painting, and they have become the subjects of major museum exhibitions, such as the 2014 Metropolitan Museum of Arts exhibition of contemporary ink art, as well as the state-sponsored endorsed Xingongbi, or New Brush Movement, exhibition at the National Museum of China. Yet much less has been said about decorative craft, such as blue and white porcelain. Coupled with the closing of state-owned factories and the development of a more market-driven economy, China's changing environment provided a suitable shift of ceramic production from a utilitarian and collective craft to an independent art form produced by individual artists. And in the hands of these contemporary artists, both from China and other parts of the world, porcelain is transformed into an artistic means of communication. These artists take the medium that seems to be stuck in time and stuck in the contrast, uh, construct of tradition and bring it into the contemporary conversation. Very often, it brings up confusion and anxiety as we struggle to pinpoint and label the works and the artists behind them. Before jumping to the contemporary practices, I thought we should re-examine the emergence of blue and white porcelain and its close association with Chinese tradition. What I found is that by surveying the production and trade of blue and white porcelain, its association with China perhaps has always been this oversimplification of the multiple cultures it was inspired from and adapted into. It is said that boom, white porcelain was inspired by ceramics coming from Persia, which were decorated in blue pigments, only to be able to be, only able to be produced with a specific, specific, specific kind of clay found in a small town in China called Jingdezhen. The process also needed a specific type of cobalt that was imported from Afghanistan. For a long time, the production process was kept as a trade secret from other countries. Blue and white porcelain was proudly regarded by the Chinese as of their own cultural heritage. It was heavily exported during the maritime trade to satisfy the European desire of acquiring something exotic from the Far East. Even before the modern conceptions of globalization, with the regular exportation of it to European countries beginning in the 15th century, blue and white porcelain had become a global commodity. Yet somehow, as a predecessor to the phenomenon of globalization, blue and white porcelain is still recognized as a solely Chinese craft, rooted in centuries of tradition and forever thought of to be unchanging since the highest ceramic production in the 16 and 1700s. Ai Weiwei's Go School is an example of contemporary artists in this millennium who incorporate the layered history of this traditional craft into their works. He represents a generation of artists practicing in the 2000s that attempt to do more than mere revival of this craft. By cleverly reversing the blue and white decoration into the interior of the vase, I plays with the traditional Chinese art form. I'm telling from the outside, as viewers look inside to see the blue and white decoration that is similar to Yuan Dynasty ceramic design, the work is immediately seen as a symbol of his Chinese ethnicity as opposed to his participation and critique in the contemporary world. Ice piece is clearly a challenge to the traditional craft of blue and white porcelain, yet his work subtly hints at this phenomenon in the treatment of Chinese contemporary artists. Any practice adopted from China's past is automatically excluded from a contemporary discourse and instead written as a continuation of tradition that belongs to an unmodernized or unwesternized past. Ai's work represents an awkward situation for many contemporary artists who have chosen to work with China's historic art forms. The works represent a distinct break from tradition as Chinese artists attempt to convey the contemporary experience, yet they are still labeled as Chinese and therefore automatically rejected from the contemporary discourse. There seems to be a clear and mutually exclusive line between what is Chinese art and what is contemporary, and this dilemma has propelled artists to question whether our traditional methods can still be helpful in the labeling and categorizing of art of this kind. Ni Hai Feng's of the departure and the revival is an outward exploration into the relevance of the Chinese identity and the globalized trade of blue and white porcelain. 
In this project, Ni Haifeng collected everyday objects used and discarded by citizens in Delft, the Dutch town once known for its imitation of blue and white porcelain. He shipped these quotidian objects to Jingdezhen, where craftsmen copied them in porcelain. The transferred objects were then shipped back to the Netherlands. The exhibition of this project included documents, photographs, videos of the transformative process, as well as an overwhelming amount of porcelain objects. The process echoed the trade of porcelain in the previous centuries when European clients would send over desired foreign objects to the craftsmen of Jingdezhen. These would often be wooden models of objects that were not familiar to these craftsmen, and after copying the model, the produced ceramics were exported back to the European countries. One of the steps in this process that can best exemplify Ni Haifeng's efforts are when these objects are all copied in the same material and decorated with the same generic patterns. This marks the transformation of a personal belonging into a more uniform and abstract object. The materiality of blue and white porcelain seems to make the once familiar Dutch object foreign, just like how the Dutch objects were foreign to the craftsmen. The result is an object that is seemingly familiar and yet not immediately definable for both parties. The exchange of goods through export and import creates a fusion of identities and confuses us. Are these objects still Dutch goods or are they now Chinese productions? Ni Haifeng's work seems to be a quest for his own self-identity. Being a Chinese artist, now living in the Netherlands, he is constantly thinking about what it means to be Chinese in the West. And, and the solution he has arrived at is perhaps the same for his artwork, an identity that is constantly in flux. Ultimately, Ni Haifeng's questioning of the existence of a static identity in our age becomes the answer to Ai's observed obstacles. Perhaps a more fluid understanding is needed for a surveying of contemporary art. Moreover, it is exactly because of the long and global history of blue and white porcelain that becomes, so, that becomes so relevant in the study of contemporary art in this day and age. Its vast dissemination into European cities created a global experience of this medium that no other art form can afford. The trading of blue and white porcelain globally afforded experience to people outside of China that they have now claimed to be their own. <coughs> Working previously as a conservator, Brook de Vries was ultimately confronted by two different values of conserving a piece. The Japanese way of celebrating the history of an object by showing the repairs, or the European way of making it completely invisible. Evident through his work, he chose the celebration of history, showing the broken ceramic as an artwork that merits its own appreciation. Growing up in the Netherlands, Vuk de Vries' work pays homage to 17th and 18th century still life paintings he observed everywhere in his childhood. Amidst all the luxurious and exotic items in these paintings, there is also the common thing of vanitas that reminded the viewer of life's eventual end. Coupled with a Japanese sense of appreciation for all things shattered, Vuk de Vries seems to give his reinterpretation of vanitas, where the shattered bowl serves as the end to the beauty of the whole porcelain bowl, New life emerges from the beauty of the shattered pieces. The Chineseness that is associated with the, with the porcelain bowl becomes inconsequential to Bouc de Vries. Instead, he sees the porcelain bowl mainly through the lens of Dutch still life paintings. Like many other artists, he sees blue and white porcelain not as a Chinese craft to, to signify China, but as an artistic means through which he is able to convey his own understanding of realities. Although I have mostly examined blue and white ceramics that roughly correlate to the traditional shapes and decorative motif in the Chinese historical tr origin, we also see artists such as Felicity, Felicity Alif, Brandon Tang, and Harumi Nakashima re-examining porcelain as not a medium for what Westerners deem decorative arts, but medium with sculptural and aesthetic potential. In their respective works, they try to eliminate the Western ideological barriers that have constrained and limited the production of blue and white porcelain to purely Chinese and minor arts. Although commenting on different contemporary issues or historical tradition, traditions, all of them seem to explore and blur the boundaries that confine blue and white porcelain. This reconfiguration of historical porcelain production as a core, is at the core of blue and white porcelain being produced by artists today. With the help of contemporary works in the blue and white porcelain medium, we can begin to see a breakdown of identity and tradition. For Chinese artists, they begin to question the identity of Chineseness or Chinese art as these labels can no longer provide a sufficient explanation for the experiences in the contemporary world. They are reconsidering the media and art form as an artistic outlet for their inquiries in an attempt to express the contemporaneity experienced in this hyper-globalized world. 
No longer are they stuck in the discursive discourse of the East-West economy that turns a blind eye to these artists of innovation and relevance to contemporary art, but are ultimately asking questions that begin to break down these historical constructs of the East and the West. For artists in other parts of the world, they are taking on the medium as one that represents their own identity and heritage, one that does not particularly involve a correlation or relationship to China. But even so, categorizing these artists as Chinese and, ar and artists in other parts of the world will leave out too much in the contemporary age when every identity seems to be overlapping inter and interchanging. Contemporary art can no longer be categorized or defined based on locality or historical origins. Moreover, the situation that Chinese contemporary artists are facing today demands a much more dynamic understanding of their artistic efforts when dealing with traditional craft and media. Whether practices in blue and white medium, it advocates and shows a demand for a more fluid understanding and more accurate representation of the contemporaneity that is felt by these artists. A global art historical discipline that acknowledges the world as global, fluid, and dynamic. Thank you. We have, can you hear me? Does this help? Much? Yeah. <laughs> a little bit? I'll project as well. Um, first of all, I want to thank the panelists for a really wonderful panel and a really wonderful series of talks. So thank you so much for this. Um, I really enjoyed this. I, I have a number of questions myself, but we also have 20 minutes of discussion. So I want to open up to you first um, for any questions or comments, responses to any of the panelists, the panel, panel as a whole. Um, would anyone have any questions to begin with? Yes. Uh, for, uh, um, Professor Aku. Well, Professor Aku, I was wondering, the, I saw that 2016 was the date of the collecting policy mm -hmm. that spe specifically excluded non-Western uh, um, collecting. Uh, and has that now officially changed or no, or what is this, is there any particular status of that? Well, so being the director, nobody can really tell me that I can't change it, uh, which is exciting. Um, but, uh, sure. But I, uh, I don't know that it really, it does, okay. It does. Oh, for live stream, okay, cool. All right, I'll talk <laughs> with it then, pretend <laughs> it changes the something in the room, anyway. Um, so I, I know the director of the Mathers quite well, and I've actually done more research at Mathers than I have at Sage. So I have a really strong connection with them. And I understand why that decision was made. I'm not necessarily saying that we have to disrupt the Western, non-Western. I think there's a, actually a pretty fuzzy line between Western and non-Western. And so I want to push the boundaries on that and uh, make even our Western collection more reflective of the global world that we live in. There's no reason that it shouldn't be more diverse and inclusive than it is. So that's, yeah, it took me a year to wrap my head around what I could do with it, but I think I'm there now. <laughs> I came in late, I was in the other session, and Heather, I'm sorry, I just need to ask you, why was there a slide of Paoli, Indiana on your last, what, what did oh, I miss? Oh, 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 only because it's a, an example of like rural Indiana. I mean, I realized like Paoli, there's that whole weirdness with like the KKK connection, that's not why I'm interested in Paoli. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> yeah, thank you. Sure. So I have a, a question that's sort of influenced by Karin, your comment, and the, and the ways you were saying, you know, you kind of counted, we don't need to call this global, global, something about the global, you want to call this thinking about circulations and infrastructures, right? And so that made me think a bit about all of the, the presentations that are used, in some ways, the two of you, um, 
Cindy and Heather are, are say, talking about the need for global methods or global uh, recognition of global circulations. Um, on the other hand, over here, I think you're using other vocabularies to get at like complex infrastructure, right? Other terms that sort of operate for you um, in, in, you know, more productively, right? So I guess I'm interested in hearing, as this is framing the global, but what for you the possibilities and the problems of the term global is for you and what that affords you or does not afford you? Because I'm hearing you all address it e even if it's in its absence. Um, I think for me, um, I really do like this idea of global contemporary art, just because um, my studies are in um, predominantly China, and that China has been excluded from um, most of the art historical discourse that has been happening before, um, maybe like before, um, before uh, 20 decades ago. So, um, so this is why I thought global would be a really nice way to try to include most of the regions that um, historically our historical narratives have um, kind of left out and have kind of ignored. And I think it's a great way to start the process of thinking about other, there exist other art forms in other countries that are equally as modernized or as contemporary as the ones we have in your America. For me, um, you know, like the fashion industry is very globalized, so you'd think that the scholarship would also be very globalized. It is not. It's really painfully unglobal in its thinking in many cases. And it's a relatively small field compared. So, for example, like I study contemporary Islamic fashion, everyone else who's in that field is either an art historian or an anthropologist. So, being in fashion design and working with objects, I'm really the rarity. So, I'm fighting an uphill battle, but I love. I only study non-Western fashion. I really think that we have to put a stake in and say that this is really important. And it's not just about Western fashion. There are so many other wonderful fashion systems in the world. So um, I, it's not so much that I, uh, OK, so there's a moment in the paper where I say that, that global contemporary art earns the adject, uh, adjective global uh, self, effectively self-consciously, right, by taking uh, systems of circulation as being part of the object. But th part of the issue is that that self-consciousness among the artists has to be itself an object of study. And so I can't just agree. So someone like Ai Weiwei is very clearly using the histories of circulation uh, in order to comment upon his own globality as a person and also as, a, as an artistic, uh, as an artist and then also as a political cause, like as a human being who is a political cause, right? And so all of that is, is very self-conscious. And so infrastructure allows me to, to get a bit of analytical distance from that rather than simply uh, falling into this uh, sort of celebratory um, discourse of global contemporary art, like finally we're with the program. The second thing is that, uh, is that I started out by working in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and the, uh, the infrastructures have grown, but uh, they're continuous with, it, with that earlier international period. And so earlier there was a paper that had the distinction between international and global. And actually that distinction is within this history as well. And I think if you look at the Biennale, as a good, that's a good example of moving from a Venice model to a Kochi model, moving from a, a national representation model to something that's a bit more something else. That I think that has the history of the move from international to global within it. So that's obviously Manuela's turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. I mean, this is a great uh, question, I, I, and I, I'm really glad to, you know, uh, to be having this conversation here. Um, what I think I've, I've been trying to do with this paper is, um, you know, I, I thought of this, uh, you know, art, architecture, um, archaeology, and heritage complex to study that particular um, uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, yeah, yeah it, to, to study that particular situation when this 
global cultural form actually lands in Kochi and see what happens. But this um, analytical cluster might not work at all if I shift Venice. In fact, I, I, I actually, I'm doing a big project um, at the Venice Archive, uh, the Venice Biennale Archive, or uh, if I shift to Shanghai, the Shanghai Biennale, where, you know, that's part of the book, and this might work really poorly. So I wanted to have something like a tool to, to really understand what was going on there. Um, and then to make it, you know, to, to actually emplace that, 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 um, the, that, that sort of cultural form into, I mean, yeah, in, 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 in Kochi, in that particular situation. Um, I don't know if it makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. I might have missed this one. I went to the bathroom. Please excuse me. But um, um, I like the idea of, of the infrastructure. I'd like to learn more about that. And I'm just wondering if we could put I'm sorry to, that I don't think this goes to your paper, but for the three of you, like, if I understand it right, it, it's bringing us, it, it draws our attention to the kind of um, pathways of circulate, like not just taking circulation for granted, but trying to unpack it and to, to sort of look at the different nodes or structures of those pathways, right? So. Can you, can you put yourselves in conversation with each other? So in other words, Manuela, I, I would like you to talk about um, you know, the fact that this model of architecture, I don't know, uh, uh, get the complex, right? yeah. Right? That complex. complex. <laughs> does that travel, like, does that, is, is that the infrastructure or is the infrastructure the thing that the complex travels through, and then what's the implication of that? So, you know, and then the same thing with this, the porcelain as a, as a, not a genre, but you know, a type of cultural production, right? Does, does, can you think out loud a little bit about the, in, the, the um, characteristics of the infrastructure that you're seeing and it's so interesting because it's referencing the past, right? So how that past infrastructure might, you know, I, I wonder if it's generative to sort of wed the vocabulary. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Peggy. Um, well, I, I, I think that I can call infrastructure also what I've been talking about, you know, is it a form of infrastructure, although I, it did not really occur to me to uh, think of the, 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 the venues as infrastructure, but, you know, then I will be. Um, but I, I use the, the complex, like borrowed, you know, re, 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 yeah, borrowed from Foster to study the effects of circulation of the form to that particular locale. But I'm not sure, as I said earlier, if this, this, this complex travels well, you know, can be circulated as exactly in the same way as the Biennale cultural form, because I said that, you know, if I take Venice and I think of this, you know, art, archaeology, uh, architecture, heritage, some of the stuff will be relevant, but some of it, I mean, the, I have to come up with something else. Um, and same thing as Shanghai, same, you know, the same kind of, I, I would have the same problem um, in other locations. So this uh, sort of uh, analytical bundle is specific. I mean, right now I'm thinking it's, you know, specifically for this particular Biennale. Oh, this is a paper beyond 
what's happening in, in this faraway corner in India is to sh show that these this configuration is is replicated in these different places, and then there is this kind of the, going back to the conversation earlier this morning about mm. the global and the particular, and the global and the particular are in tension with each other in yeah. these different ways in these different places at these different times. But oh, isn't it interesting that I can sort of see these things coming together in different ways? But yeah. I, yeah, no, I know. It is something that I want to think about because, you know, thinking of the history of the Venice Biennale, and I'll shut uh, It's like, for example, the whole ecological thing, you know, that was very relevant where the, the whole Giardini space was being, you know, restructured or whatever, you know, thinking about national pavilions, what to build, by whom, etc. Um, so, I don't know, I, it's, it's a question that I have to think about because I really think that this cluster works, at least for me, <laughs> at this point, you know, quite well here, but then, yeah, th then I move somewhere else and I'm still looking at the sort of the uh, declination of that cultural form somewhere, but I'm not sure if I can just take this and, and then, you know, apply it to that particular situation, but definitely food for thought, thank you. Um, so I chose the medium porcelain, blue and white porcelain, because uh, so um, I chose blue and white porcelain as the medium for my focus because of its past circulation, how it was the history, the global history of how it was so global and so um, identifiable to one country. And I think that a lot of the artists today who are using this medium are aware of the history, but some um, some choose to emphasize their own experience with it, while some tend to comment on um, its ties to China or to the trade that <coughs> happened um, at the ad's peak when it was like 16, 1700s. Um, so one of the uh, projects I talked about, Nihai Phones of the Departure and Arrival, it was a direct comment on the historical circulation of the trade of global, uh, the trade of blue and white ceramics, while um, Duke de Vuy, he chose not to comment on the circulation that it afforded. He, but he, his artwork is, and his, but his use of porcelain and blue and white porcelain is a product of the circulation that happened. So it's very, I'm, I'm still thinking about it, but I think that this is one of the, the circulation and the globality it had a long time ago is the reason I chose this medium and how people are still using it today to express their own experiences. So um, just to bring uh, this back a little bit more to the more uh, to the rest of the framing the global, one of the things that that led me to think about infrastructure as a framework for this is that um, is that I wanted to not just talk about global contemporary art and and art within its own context, but also the way in which. Uh, the infrastructures that were built after 1991 or that were extended to India, financialization, for instance, in the, uh, the pouring of capital into, uh, into India, which is exactly how you get a market in art, the uh, changing and, uh, and the relaxing of, uh, of export restrictions and import restrictions, uh, which is absolutely crucial to uh, the movement of art, are that, that these sorts of things are, are really what made possible the boom in, in Indian contemporary art. And so it's, it was actually impossible for me to d tell that story without having that be central. But most of the discussion of global contemporary art infrastructure excludes the art object. It's rude. It's rude to talk about artistic form, yes. Meaning you don't ever want to say that the artist might be so gauche as to actually be influenced by things like, like the changing of, of, of the market, and that that would actually impinge upon their artistic uh, practice. That is, that is actually totally forbidden. It, it's, it's not, it's not poss generally possible within art, histor uh, art historical and certainly art critical discourse for all of the reasons that you and I have been talking about for the last two days, things like you need the artist to give you permission so they, they, very often you have to pass what you're going to say about their work in, in, in front of their eyes before they'll give you permission to print their images, et cetera, these sorts of things. So you work with the consent of the artist. And so it's been very tricky to find out how to tell the story and not cheapen 
what the artists are doing because they're actually super intelligent, really smart people that you want to respect. That's why I work on them, right? But so it's a tricky balance act, right? How do you make this but not have it be determined by globalization, right? These are agents. And so that balance is what led me to the interaction of the human and the non-human, basically. I think one thinking, you know, uh, watching this panel, and then thinking about some of the things that emerged in a couple of the morning panels on the surveillance and the performance panels, and kind of some of the um, dialogue that was going back and forth in those panels, I see it. This is kind of more of a comment, but I think maybe I'd be interested in your reaction to it. Of kind of a set of tensions on one hand of especially with uh, looking at kind of this metaphor of rudeness or rhizome and then as compared to flow and kind of the notion of ocean, uh, you know, looking at kind of these, Im the po importance of the local and the global or the importance of the global and the local, I guess, is kind of one of the tensions there. And the other one was kind of looking at different elements, and I think this is getting at some of the things that you're talking about, is kind of the different elements of the, you know, the circuit of culture, the producer, the author, the text, the reading, or the audience and the reception. Um, and I'm wondering maybe, you know, if it's just kind of an observation that it was, it, I saw a lot of echoes of that in this panel as well. And so I was wondering if you wanted to maybe comment on kind of fitting into either either one or, you know, both of those debates that's kind of lingering throughout the day here. I did hear the panel on performance, and I love the rhizome metaphor. I'm definitely going to look for the, that literature. Um, it really it speaks to the issue of like Islamic fashion, for example, because um, so most of the scholarship on Islamic fashion is either about Europe, of course, the you know large immigrant populations, and then also uh, and the burqa ban in France and all of that. Um, or the Middle East, which, you know, makes sense. But the thing is that it really, um, I mean, in Islamic studies in general, the Middle East is really privileged in that scholarship. And I'm, I have a Western fashion collection, but there are Muslims who live here in the West, and they are Western, and it's not a, a lesser than, it, you know, they have their own, you know, they're growing their own new fashions. They have their own concerns. Yes, they're it's a globalized industry and they're absolutely communicating with people in other parts of the world and getting fashions and importing things and sending things back and the internet is a huge way you know mechanism that that's occurring but um but we can't privilege the middle east like i'm you know when i'm collecting my uh you know fashions from macy's like they're made for the u.s market <laughs> So uh, I really like the rhizome idea is that it's not just stemming from one central source, but all, you know, all these little things popping up around. I, I love that metaphor. Yeah, Russell, I went to the other two panels. So uh, I think we had, so that's, that's why I can't uh, necessarily uh, comment on this, but I, you know, sorry. Yeah. But the rest of you can. <laughs> Is there any final burning question? Well, we've hit 5 p.m. It's been a long day. Um, so I'll, we'll end the panel here. And if you want, have any questions, of course, there's time after here, tomorrow onwards. So I look forward to further conversation. Thank you again for a wonderful panel. Thank you.